Miamians and listeners from around the world, welcome to another episode of Miami Global Net. Today's guest, we have Maestro Alvise Caselati, creator and music director of the Opera Italiana in the Air. We will talk about the widely successful project, Miami, and the impact the pandemic has had on the industry. Welcome to Miami Global Net Podcast, where we showcase the people and organizations that support Miami's international landscape. Learn from local business owners, startups, diplomats, and community leaders. Get to know the tools and services that are out there that help you invest and grow in South Florida. Miami is a true global city where one can live and do business with a global reach. I understand you're in, uh, in Milano. Yes, uh, I just arrived after three months of isolation in the UK, and uh, I uh, thought it would be safer by now to come back here, so now we'll be here for another two weeks and uh, do as little traveling as possible and as much uh, uh, music immersion as possible. How was your isolation over there? Well, it was, you know, at the beginning, um, the, uh, you think in life when last year I didn't even have a day to breathe, to breathe. And for myself, I thought that having three months of a break in order to study, to, uh, you know, do research and to do all the things you think you need to do to grow as an artist and to take some time to, to, um, to go in depth about on, on certain things. And then all of a sudden you have it, but it's uh, not the ideal circumstance because you know, it's, uh, uh, it was quite depressing. I have to say this, this whole, um, isolation, this, the fact that it was an imposition, obviously, uh, it didn't create the, the ideal case scenario for studying for peace, for inner peace. So, I have to say that the first month was quite tough and it was even difficult to focus on music because it was uh, just uh, sad. Um, then I have to say after three weeks or so, um, I started seeing a little results. I started, you know, really thinking that I should have, uh, as you know, I mean, the people like me, especially conductors and orchestras, this is uh, choirs. This is a, Uh, you know, a field, uh, our job is about being with the people in the middle of the people with, with as little distance as possible. So already uh, to, for an orchestra to play all separate and one meter, one from the other is really not the ideal case scenario where every musician wants to hear and see what the others are doing and, uh, and look at the master as well. So the togetherness is challenged and uh, this whole thing is unnatural for our world. So I have to say uh, our world was the one of the most severely hit under this point of view uh, because there is little that we can do. It means my working from home, a conductor conducting others from his own home or her own home to other, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that makes really sense, something you do one time uh, to show that you're close to the people, you want to give a message of hope, but it was not really uh, how the, this profession can go forward. So the first month was tough. And then, um, you know, you start thinking that you, every day is a working day. So trying to schedule a routine and have uh, a normal day of the week and weekends where you wake up and work and study and and produce work, um, then I try to use a little bit of uh, Rossini inspiration. Gioacchino Rossini was famous after he quit as a composer for being the best chef uh, possible. And uh, his recipes actually are quite heavy. But uh, if he is uh, one of the biggest examples on how the art form of music was combined, <laughs> the same biggest, the same great mind uh, use this time to create recipes and to really create an art form in the kitchen. And this is what like everybody in the world <laughs> started doing, trying to find some, uh, uh, you know, some happiness. So they, they've been 
you know, one of the happiest part of the day was to meet in the kitchen with the, with the family and the, you know, my companion and, and their son and, uh, you know, and create great, uh, pieces of, uh, uh, art in the kitchen and, uh, and share. And it's a moment of, which is also very, very, very Italian because the, you know, one of the moments where families uh, in old school families used to speak, um, used to be, uh, dinner and work. And then, you know, then you have the time where all the millennials are criticized for checking the phone, not really paying attention. And before the millennials were people watching TV during dinner and during lunch. So this, uh, this whole thing, um, uh, created a stability in the house that there is a certain time we're all gathered together for dinner and for lunch. And then where the rest of the time you use the technology. So you make the best of technology to reach out to people that are far away, see them in the face and something like gives you a level of comfort and closeness. that was not even thinkable or possible, uh, even 10 plus years ago. So, um, it was int first introduced by Skype. Uh, so I have to say that uh, it was the best, the best possible time for something, for an epidemic to happen. Um, the world in which we live with technology, which made it much easier for everybody, made everybody feel close to, closer together and uh, produce as much as possible in terms of studying. So I studied composition. I put in my repertoire um, around six operas, I would say, uh, that I would need to conduct. So I try to do the biggest part of our job uh, for people who are not familiar with what conductors do <laughs> and, uh, or musicians. We, before going to the theater, we need to arrive prepared. So the free time, free, is not really free, but all the time that we don't spend in the theater, we spend studying. So it's a job where there is no Saturday and Sunday. And there is a, it's just studying and going to the theater and working. Uh, so it was uh, I could, so I created my own balance during this period. Uh, the you know some some time for um, time with uh, uh, social time for lunch and dinners, and then studying time or business conference calls uh, with. Zoom, for instance, <laughs> and uh, for to you know to make connections, to continue to talk to my world and see, and understand the challenges, and uh, uh, some be with some people a think tank on how to solve problems and and how to go forward and what's the best thing to do, and uh, is it acceptable? Uh, is it possible? You know, we all asked ourselves. Uh, some major orchestras did great studying to see especially in Germany, um, whether the wind instruments cause a movement in the air, which can make it easier for the, all the people around and the public and the artists to get the virus or not. Does this have an influence when you sing? You, do you move the air really or not? Oh, wow. Like the, like the, so, the sound waves, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Because pushing it, the air in a way that exactly. Can, but imagine a trumpet or imagine a trombone or a French horn. Is that an amplification? Does that work as an amplification of the air and polluted air or, you know, virus air versus does that create a more risk to the artists themselves and the public or not? You know, some people said maybe to play, to put them in plexiglass would be safer. Other people like German orchestra found that the movement caused by these instruments is uh, simply non-significant like singers and therefore placing them at a distance of one or two meters was sufficient according to different studies. So, you know, we followed the, um, um, what the new guidelines would be in the virus era. Uh, if you think about it, not even during the world war, um, our world was, shut down, first of all, at the same, was in the same situation and the same condition, the whole world all at one time, not even during World War, because not all the world participated to the conflict and not even during the world wars. 
uh, did ever theater shut down or schools. So this was so unprecedented, so bad, so violent at the beginning. You know, you feel like your liberty, your freedom is repressed. That, uh, you know, everybody had the same challenges. This was the, at least the positive thing, people coming out of this situation share the same experience, more or less, in terms of, uh, you know, some people were in bigger houses, some people were in smaller houses, but everybody went through the same thing, rich or poor. Um, the same, uh, it's, you know, level of being on top of each other or trying to um, put the, you know, not being able to move, basically, or with limited moves and with the restrictions on freedom. So I think, you know, in some cases, uh, like everyone uh, can cry over the situation or can try to take the positive out of the situation and think, think on how best the work, the world should work after and how much time you wasted doing things that you didn't want to do before or um, how beautiful it is in the end to be able to cook home because you, you, you're putting the efforts in the end and how beautiful it is to spend time all together. And it's, uh, you know, it's just a question of uh, uh, putting things uh, uh, in the ideal frame of mind. You can make it the worst experience possible or you can make it the best experience possible. Certainly not the most ideal situation for nobody, but then it's up to the single person to at least extract something out of it. Now, when I was in the horrible flight something that was about to fall down a few years ago, the Miami-Milano flight, imagine that. <laughs> so it's much safer to, call, to speak via Zoom right now, thinking about that. <laughs> uh, the plane was about to fall, and uh, we did an emergency landing in, uh, um, in, um, in St. John... Uh, St. John in Canada. So you were on this plane? Most, uh, I was on this plane. So okay. I was, you know, everybody was close to dying and, the, you know, the plane precipitated. A lot of people hurt. It was on all the news. It was January, end of January, January 25th, 2016. Out of an experience like that, there is nothing positive that you take and you walk outside of that experience is an experience that you have to forget basically a because i cannot afford not taking a flight i need to move and i cannot afford being afraid of taking a flight so i would need to go back and not think about what what can happen therefore anything in that on that experience there is nothing that, that you cannot prepare for something like that you know there is a degree of luck or bad luck if you are on you know on that one Instead, out of an experience like this one, when you are isolated at home with family, there is a whole universe that you can explore, especially today, imagine, uh, with Internet. Imagine what in the past, in the 70s and 80s, people, when people were thirsty of knowledge, when they wanted to learn about anything, um, talking about researchers at university, the key was to be close to an important professor who would give you access to knowledge, access to the books of the library. That itself was giving you uh, the possibility to be a privileged person by the fact that you had access to knowledge, access to books. So now, no matter how big is your house, no matter how big is your library, you have online any kind of possible bad knowledge, obviously, you know, you, there is all sorts of things, but you have also a lot of, uh, you know, access to information that didn't exist before. So in this term, uh, do you have, doing this experience with internet access and with being able to reach to any possible kind of information and, and books that are online and any kind of thing is really a much better experience that, you could possibly think uh, in the past, uh, you know, people spoke, spoke about the Spanish flu, which hit also America. That is also the other time where theaters closed, closed down. Um, uh, 
you you know you see in the Italian books about Manzoni, who is the father of our language in the 1800s or 1600s, the past. You know, we had a large experience, especially in Venice, that had, you know it's a port. The quarantine was in you know was invented. But quarantine means 40 days in Latin. Quaranta, you know, is like in Spanish. You understand the root. Uh, quarantena, quarantena, uh, quarantine means uh, 40 days that you were really isolated without speaking with anybody. And that some people coming from Europe being afraid of bringing illnesses to this country. Uh, that's also what happened. And that was also what was happening when Europeans were coming to America. You know, they were bringing sort of things for which the locals did not have antibodies. And this is how things, you know, uh, sometimes started. So there was in the past a better knowledge. And all of a sudden, we are left with uh, 1920 versus 2020. <laughs> so 100 years, nobody was there 100 years ago to remember it. <laughs> so to remember how the local governments acted back then. So. I, I feel now there is uh, 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 there have been there are challenges. I mean, especially we look at a certain with certain preoccupation to what is happening in America in certain parts where there is social anxiety is going into violence into some level of criminality. So there are this is also a product of being refrained. Is like a a situation of uh, that uh, that will find it's finding its channel in that in that way. But you know, I think we we are coming out of it, hopefully. And uh, at least there was a lot to learn out of this uh, experience. And uh, uh, the whole you may say that the whole world now with the policy of washing hands um, that everybody has from the smallest town in India or China or uh, South Africa or South America or Italy and to the most advanced uh, cities, uh, you know, um, everybody knows how dangerous it is to touch somewhere and then to bring your hands and to, your face. To, to, to your face or, you know, how you can avoid... And, you know, you were hearing about these things, you know, when I was living, in, um, you know, I'm a New Yorker. So when I was mostly in New York, uh, everybody said, uh, even there, after you walk out of the subways or anything, you know, before, always wash hands. And because uh, you don't want to put anything in your eyes or mouth or become sick. And people who do that avoid getting sick. At least 50% is prevention or more. So I think now it's not only uh, that, but the whole world is uh, educated on this and uh, uh, the possibility to get sick with anything, not only COVID. It's, uh, you know, people paying more attention to that will be less sick and less. Uh, so th th there are a lot of, um, you know, positive things that were deriving from uh, we, we can walk with out with this experience. I, I agree. I agree with you. Um, and, and a lot of the things you've been, you've been talking about, especially when, when it comes to the times that we are, that we are ready to kind of like live through something like this with technology and the access to education, you can get, you can pull a degree now uh, from online, you know, from your, from the comfort of your own home. Um, and a lot of companies are realizing that, you know, um, some cost savings can come from that. Some quality, quality of life increases can come from that. Of course, it's not ready for every industry when it comes to um, uh, uh, some entertainment options, some like, like in your case with opera and being able to train with your, with your, with your team. <laughs> um, but talk, talking about what you do, um, I would like to dive in a little bit into Opera Italiana in the Air, which is how we first met. You know, mm -hmm. with this beautiful initiative to, um, um, if I remember, if I remember correctly, to bring opera in a, in a public open space so that people can re-encounter and re-re 
discover this this beautiful concept of of opera um so i, I know that your first shows your first performances of opera Italian in the air was in new york before you brought them down to miami so why don't you tell us a little bit about, about um how opera italiana came to be so the the first realization is uh, uh you know that every musician aspires to conduct in the best theaters in the world you know this is how you make a career uh, you make a career after you have sang in x theaters out theater so our career is a bit defined our level um as, as to where we have conducted and where we got to conduct and interact and then i asked myself what this is what we take from the system to uh become famous or to make a career but what can we give to this world what is i mean obviously when we perform we give to the orchestra and the public this is the chain our emotions but what is that we can add in here 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and the following years. Um, the realization was that whoever, uh, in the, that in the last 20 years, the opera world and classical music has been relegated to a niche. And uh, before any means of communication, every radio that uh, people were listening, that grandparents were listening, TV was broadcasting constantly classical music and concerts. Now, I put myself in a kid that does not have a musical family, is not exposed to classical music. All of a sudden, here's uh, rock and roll, blues, uh, uh, all other types of music. And then there is only one channel out of 100 that may, you know, where you may hear classical music. And it sounds very different and Uh, maybe it's not considered cool when they're young. And so I put myself in that, in that frame of mind and I tried to analyze the situation and thought that today there is basically no information, no marketing on our world, on this world, which is one of the most amazing. And whenever I brought friends with me to see rehearsals that did not even know what classical music was, they heard the beauty of music and the master, um, you know, the art of singing uh, with the training of the opera, the first thing they asked me is like, is there amplified? And no, because the f definition of uh, lyrical voice in a theater is when the voice itself, one person can go through the wall of the orchestra and the choir and still be heard over this mountain of instruments because it's so powerful. So it is uh, something that uh, is miraculous. And uh, every time I brought friends with me, uh, I had them, I gave them the best experience of their life. They said they had no idea that they would have loved to come and see a concert. And uh, therefore what I thought, uh, you know, sometimes you look at the stage and you see All these people, it looks like you're watching TV if you are even too far. But there are humans, there are artists who are performing right in that moment. And sometimes in opera, they are covered with masks, with a wig, they're acting. Uh, but sometimes what, you know, is interpreting a, an old person is a 20-year-old kid. <laughs> so with a huge voice and huge talent. So yeah. Uh, I thought we need to explain this because it's uh, it's not obvious to people and uh, there is less and less interest uh, now uh, with, uh, you know, everything that is going now. The fashion is uh, hip hop, pop, every kind of other musical genre, which is uh, also, which I also appreciate, but I'm in this field and I can explain better the beauty of my field. So, uh, The first thing I thought is, especially in Europe, when you have these theaters that look amazingly like temples, and it's so austere sometimes in the theater that you're almost afraid to, to go and because you must be somebody attached to culture, that uh, sometimes it's intimidating. And this was exactly the opposite feel 
uh, opera used to be the po- most popular music by by definition something that even in the folks people would sing arias of opera back then my grandparents used to sing opera arias like kids are singing uh in the 80s were singing madonna and today they're singing kanye west another so that was happening back then so when i uh the key for me was give people access to it before they shouldn't pay a ticket uh, eliminating the first reason why people don't go to a theater may also be the most obviously a ticket costs money and you don't spend money if you don't know what the experience is or means uh so um unless you have a friend who told you go see that movie you also don't go see a random movie unless you saw the advertisement of that movie the trailer and you go but there is no trailer of opera no trailer of uh, you know we don't have uh, that kind of system yet which i would be doing as the head of a theater today i would you know put camera things give a sort of trailer to people show what these current actors are doing and then broadcast it so I thought I make it easy. I go outside of theaters. Therefore, Opera Italiana is in the air because it's not in a closed space. So it's in the air, uh, whether it's a park, whether it's a square, um, anywhere outside of theaters, offer a performance for free, then hire journalists to talk about it, to inform people that this performance will exactly happen on that time. And then the most important thing, Uh, try to uh, involve as many young people as possible in the orchestra and in the singers because a young person, uh, somebody will be 20, 20, 20 years old who sings, who sees the same people's age on the other hand, will not say, oh, opera is for old people. No, opera is performed by people your age and by people older. So it doesn't have a an age preference. And uh, today you walk in theaters, you only see old people. Uh, because sometimes, you know, good things come uh, with age. You get some appreciation of certain things that you didn't have before, but uh, nothing, you know, refrains you from understanding that earlier. So um, first, my first thinking was attract um, the new public potentially that will then go to theaters and make them fall in love with, uh, with the beauty of our world. The second, of course, is to give emotions, to make them understand our world, that it's, uh, you know, these people who are playing in the orchestra and, and have been singing have worked so hard all their lives, since when maybe they're five or eight or 10 years old, to be perfect to perfection. So it's such an educational tool as well. It's like sports. In sports and in the arts and in this art form, people learn that if they work hard, uh, they get a beautiful result, a perfection. And uh, the hard working is uh, commensurate to the level that they will reach. So there is meritocracy in sports and in the arts because you give as much, you get as much. So it's uh, the best uh, way to educate as well. Um, It's a fantastic educational experience. At the same time, it gives you culture because the opera librettos, the texts of the opera, what they're singing used to be something, a social problem that makes you think it's a, it can be a funny story, but it can also be a tragic story. And you walk out also thinking about what happens and it triggers um, you to... Uh, talk with your friends or the people you went to see opera. It was like when you talk to see and you comment on a, a history of a movie. So it has so many different aspects. Uh, they can be deeply cultural, but it can only be pure entertainment. Uh, when people come out and they see an amazing voice, uh, you know, they are had a bad and tough day at work. They go there, the level of serenity they get out of attending a concert or opera, they walk out flying after and saying, you know, uh, that they were given the best gift ever possible. So 
this, uh, uh, after we did it the first time in Central Park in New York in 2017, so many people came saying, uh, that's the first time I've come to uh, such a, you know, an event like that. Uh, I will, from now on, I will consider going to theaters to see opera, to see a concert. So you start giving them the pleasure of what they're doing. They start understanding something that they also like. It's not far from their taste. Um, you know, if you think about what are the most famous pieces in the world from our geniuses, you think about Beethoven. Ta 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 ta. Tom, 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 tom. Everybody true. knows that. Everybody knows that. Is that sophisticated writing? Yes, incredibly. Mozart seems so simple, but he's so sophisticated at the same time. Do you need to understand this sophistication, this level of sophistication to enjoy? Absolutely not. You walk out doing exactly what I just did. Or uh, you see Rigoletto, the aria of Rigoletto. People may not know that is the aria of the tenor of Rigoletto, but they walk out doing So this melody is one of the most simple things and it's as simple as effective. So at the same time, so it appeases to the most simple, to the most sophisticated mind. It's for everybody. So the idea was to share that with everybody and also in New York, we did something we need to do, we try, need to try to do uh, elsewhere, where the New York Philharmonic has this program called the Young, um, uh, Young Composers Program. And we select every year uh, a 11-year-old or 12-year-old composer um, that has made it already in the New York Philharmonic Program. And they compose a two-minute piece that they can see uh, live and we perform it for them and with them if they uh, wrote a part for themselves or they stay from the public. And the young kid, 11 years old, come to the rehearsals with us and we go through the piece. And, um, and we treat them like adults and uh, we want to know what, why they wrote that piece and what were they thinking. And it's an amazing is to, to see. I mean, I have seen the, the last two times we, um, we, you know, we selected two children. Uh, they were Latin American. One was Brazilian and the other one was Venezuelan. You will be shocked. They spoke in public better than any other adult that you have heard. You think <laughs> they will have a future as a politicians with young kids, uh, but uh, um, they are already politicians in, you know, the term politics means the, uh, the people, all right? So the community. And therefore, uh, the goods of the community is the political, right? Uh, and they already are politicians in that they already are giving their own good and their own music to the whole community. So it's uh, this is another part of Opera Italiana is in the air. So another uh, part of Opera Italiana is in the air, which I was devoting my time to develop. It was the social, to give the possibility to unprivileged children to attend the performance. Uh, that means not to go to, uh, in New York would be to go to the Bronx or to go to, no, is to bring, for instance, the people from there or to the concert and put them in first row or um, to see, to, to experience this with us or bring, uh, we had connected with the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospitals in New York, reach out to the music therapy department and, you know, and create a link with the music therapy department, their patients and us in order to, um, you know, reach out to, uh, to certain people that, uh, that we want to appeal to. You know, we, we, we always thought, how, how much good can we do and what is worth doing? So it almost happened that I met this person by chance at an event, and then I thought, why don't we do something with you? 
it would be fantastic to join uh, all these worlds uh, rather than, you know, everybody, of course, is welcome. But then when you give this a possibility to these people who maybe have never heard classical music in all their life, then, you know, it's uh, this, again, doesn't have any, uh, is, is an, it's not discriminating music, music from wherever you are in the world when you hear this. Um, my maestro told me this story once that he, there was this guy who was listening to rock music, don, 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 you know, uh, what can be ACDC or, you know, old rock. All of a sudden, he put uh, on his, uh, his speakers, uh, instead of his... Uh, you know, headphones he put on Beethoven Symphony Number no. Nine, uh, the Ode to Joy, and these kids started crying, saying, "I've never heard something so beautiful in my life. What is it?" But so the um, classical music gave me is the field in absolute terms. I listen to any kind of music in my life. Uh, from rap to uh, blues to jazz uh, to hip hop to any kind of salsa, any kind of music. And I have to say that the biggest range of emotions was donated to me from classical music. And it's uh, difficult to explain why this is maybe me and that's maybe why I'm doing this profession because I want for people, I want to give those emotions also to the other people. Um, so when um, right now in the air, there is the virus. I can't wait for Opera Italiana is in the air when uh, Opera will take the place of the virus in the air and, uh, and, be the, the, and give the benefits to health <laughs> that it gives in terms of happiness and in terms of uh, uh, cultural experience, in terms of uh, any kind of experience that it can give from the simple, most simple peace of mind into pure entertainment to the most profound cultural experience, depending on who uh, goes to see it and, and uh, listen to us. I, mean, I have to say, when, when you came down to Miami and proposed the project and the results were, were outstanding, um, a lot of residents came out and they, they really enjoyed it, uh, I think, at least from our end and, and, and the city. And everybody was very, very happy with the results, and they were impressed. You know, people from other places came to um, to experience the the opera italianas in the air. In before you came down to Miami, how many did you do in New York? I did 2017, uh, 2018, and then we came to Miami in 2019. So I had done two in New York. And uh, and then in 2019 we did also Miami, New York, and then Naples in Italy. We brought it to to the south of Italy with the same idea to go to the places uh, of the poor, uh, the poor neighborhoods of uh, of uh, of uh, Naples initially, and then unfortunately we couldn't do it where we wanted it. We had to change location last minute. But you know the the idea was to. Uh, was exactly the same. And whether that's in Italy, where the opera was born, you might think that all oh, everybody knows opera in Italy. This is not exactly not true. <laughs> it's a, it's a, like anywhere else in the world. So uh, every, you know, this part, everybody told me, it's like, why you go to Miami? People there go to the beach. They go, they don't go to opera. They don't. It's like, wait a second. I said, uh, to uh, I have seen a city because I come to Miami quite a long time. I've seen a city that in the last 10 years invested so much in culture, so much uh, with Art Basel, starting from Art Basel, but going through all fields of music. People here, because there was only the beach at some point, people became thirsty, people became thirsty of knowing other things, of going to other things, that uh, I found that Miami had a thirst for arts and uh, curiosity. 
And I thought that this would be the curiosity. It was very dangerous because when you go to Central Park, people walk at Central Park so I can interject public coming, walking there, and then they hear the music and they become public of my performance. While in Miami, you need to walk there because you know there is a concert. Otherwise, you just don't randomly walk there uh, talking about Regatta Park. So that was, of course, the risk that people would, uh, you know, not show up or because we had no way to know since the concert is free and there is no tickets. We will know many people attend only in that very moment. Uh, so we were surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised. And there was such a magical atmosphere that night. Um, you know, when you see a lot of people happy, kids on the grass, playing, listening, families enjoying their time. It's uh, exactly, and then when you see so many happy people and how you change that day and possibly more than that day, the way they think after um, and what they may be going and search now for opera, keeping the program and, and tell friends. And this is an operation that needs to be done constantly too. And it's something that all artists should, should, should take time to do. Uh, to 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 spread the world, to spread the beauty of our hearts. You know, it's like almost like uh, you know when you read newspapers and you only read. You know, you have uh, people who only read you the necrology. You know, many people die. All all this bad news that you keep seeing, and this is exactly the opposite. This is bringing the good news, the good things that people want to hear, that people can't wait to hear, and and something that benefits everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have, I want to, I want to add to the regatta park experience. Uh, um, I think I, I felt, I felt connected to the project just, you know, helping and through the whole process. And it was awesome to see the whole turnout. Like you had people sitting formally at the beginning and then it started spreading out in the back of regatta. People had brought in their chairs, their, their pets, people were, it's like, it was a beautiful mixture of, of, of everybody that were just there enjoying a, it was a beautiful evening, by the way, it was, um, the weather was, was delicious and it was, everything just came together very, very nicely. And I also shared a little bit of that, like, we don't know how many people are going to show up, you know, especially, so it was a little bit like at the beginning, it was like, Oh my goodness, you know, but uh, at the end it was a, it was a beautiful turnout. <laughs> but this is also, you know, when it's the first time that we came to, to the credit, if there were not people like you who believed in the project who said that this is something that has potential, then, um, you know, you see, you think only of the people who go in to enjoy the sea and do nothing else than going to drink uh, in a pub or whatever. To see, to imagine that people come to something like that and enjoy it as much and or even more than anything other, anything else that they had done in the last uh, week. In fact, uh, I had people from there who told me it was the best thing that I'd seen in a while. And because it was a different formula, also, you know, we dressed the musicians in blue jeans, if you remember. In, uh, we, you know, it was casual. Yeah, people did not. People were not sitting on a stage. People were sitting on the same grass that everybody else was sitting. So it was almost like a the comfort of a chamber music concert. <laughs> a chamber music means uh, music in a chamber in your room, in a, in a comfortable environment, not in an environment that gives you, a, you know, uh, this idea of uh, intimidation. So. We wanted to make it comfortable for everybody to, to feel that, uh, you know, they were, uh, it's like, it's like going to dinner together, enjoying all of this together. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that the spirit was present that very night. There was, uh, what people still remember from that evening was that magical energy and atmosphere that is given number one from the composer. <laughs> that we chose from Puccini and Verdi's merit, but also from the artists that gave, put so much passion in it that night and gave a lot of passion to the people. And of course, in the open, you're not, the sound is not so pure 
like in the clothes, but that's not the point. We're not there to record a CV or a DVD. We're, we're there to give emotions. And if we're able to crack into someone's hearts and give them a piece of emotion and make them remember two or few seconds of music that made them cry, made them happy, gave them a strong emotion. Music has this ability to, to reach deep down into feelings of people that uh, other arts don't. Uh, done and can do as well as music. And I know that, um, and I know you were very really keen as well into getting local, local artists to, to join you. I, I never really Absolutely. got to ask you if how that went in terms of here in Miami, was it challenging? Was it easier than you expected or both? Oh, it's, it's, it's always challenging when you bring uh, piece, uh, pieces of, uh, an Italian composer to enter into the spirit. Uh, uh, you know, I always found that if I go into in Russia and I play Tchaikovsky, it's so much easier because it's inside their blood and their interpretation, you get it at uh, day one. And uh, same thing if you, you know, you play Latin American music and you have musicians uh, in Latin America they their level of comfort in playing their music and they have the rhythm inside of them it's a whole different experience or waltzes you go to vienna and you know you have artists everything is a challenge when you bring uh you know a foreign composers in one country so you, you have to be a good musicians to communicate that also to your own musicians um the challenge was is always simplification and the first of all is conveying your thoughts, because this is what conductors do. They bring, it's not only going together and be sort of, uh, a, I would say traffic director, uh -huh. but, uh, but it is uh, conveying a musical idea, make them put their minds in the head of the composer and, and interpret 50, 60 people doing one interpretation as opposed to 60 different interpretations which is possible in music. What is your favorite part of the whole process? The best part, uh, the best part of this project is uh, you have experienced it with me. It's coming to speak with a city and seeing the light in the eyes that where they understand that it's the beginning of beauty <laughs> being created something that didn't exist before and bring it into a place where there is enthusiasm to receive it. This was the best part of the process. So you are uh, highly responsible <laughs> for the success <laughs> of the whole operation. And uh, so and the enthusiasm you gave to your colleagues, um, to the city, and um, I would say this, is, uh, this was the, the best part to see that the locals are keen, are so happy to, to have it. And, uh, you know, as you know, we were so close to having it again, April 3rd, yes. 2020. And uh, when um, uh, the city of Miami was fantastic to, to receive us and they wanted us to come. But, uh, you know, in early March, I already saw what was happening in Italy. I remember. And I, and I understood the same thing was going to happen mm -hmm. there because was coming there. So I said, by April 3rd, it's not going to be possible. And uh, if it is possible, we will create a risk. Uh, and we will not bring beauty, we will create health risks. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I stopped. That means that it's only postponed. And uh, I can't wait to be down there again. And and, uh, and, um, you know, we lost, uh, we lost April, but, uh, as soon as things, uh, are, this is defeated and, uh, we kill it with the air and maybe Opera Italiana in the air will be the last drop that will kill the virus, hopefully. Um, and, uh, who knows, I, I can't wait to be, uh, to be there when things open up and are normal again and, you can go to a concert without fear or with all the precautions possible. So we shall, shall see. 
definitely. I'm sure the, the city of Miami will welcome you back whenever whenever the time allows. Um, also, you have a couple. You you mentioned that you've been working on some future operas coming up. Yes, I had. Um, you know, obviously, the concert right now, Russia is uh, not uh, uh, open for business yet, and the theaters are closed. But uh, uh, this has been postponed. Um, the the Marinsky Theater should have opened in June. Right now, as we as we, as we speak. Uh, Chicago should have happened yesterday and New York should have been June 28th. Uh, it's all being postponed to next year. Okay. Uh, if Miami is uh, resuming, um, due to weather, uh, to the nice weather you guys have there, uh, maybe November could be a good time late November to come. Awesome. Uh, so we should, I mean, we stay alert. <laughs> To, to see whether that can happen. Anywhere else is too cold to go outside uh, after uh, October, November. So you would be the first natural place where uh, we start again since, uh, you know, April should have been also, Miami should have been the first city in 19, in 2020. It was the first city Opera Italiana went in 2019. So, you know, we'll try to continue the tradition. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Maestro, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to join us and to tell us about Opera Italiana is in the air, and we're, we're really thankful. So, thank you. It was a pleasure, and uh, hope to see you and uh, everyone in Miami very soon. Grazie. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>